Hello, everyone, and welcome to another webinar Wednesday brought to you by the Concrete Preservation Alliance. Today's topic is subsurface secrets, unlocking insights on piles, soil layers, sinkholes, and hidden structures. This is the final of a three-part series focused on the use of non-destructive testing technologies to assess structures. We are the Concrete Preservation Alliance, a growing coalition of organizations committed to advancing best practices in the field of concrete preservation and infrastructure renewal, working together to promote education and awareness of concrete repair industry standards, new and innovative corrosion prevention technologies, and sustainable construction practices. We draw on our exceptional members to provide speakers that will use their industry-leading expertise to educate and bring awareness to the concrete repair industry. You can find the recordings of today's and previous presentations along with their slides on our website here at wesavestructures.info uh, under the events tab. This is also the home of our environmental impact calculator. This is a tool to create a customized preservation impact statement based on your inputs. Simply input the volume of concrete that you uh, preserved into the form and it'll automatically populate to show you an estimate of the amount of emissions, waste, and uh, sorry, waste generation and the environmental benefits of concrete preservation versus demolition. You can also print this to a PDF that allows you to showcase the difference your decisions can make in preserving the resources of our planet and how you're striving for improved sustainability. Uh, a challenge to you all before we start, we have a Q&A portion after the presentation. We are giving away a $100 Amazon gift card to the best question asked. Uh, this platform, however, does not track our, uh, our attendees' information, so you'll need to provide us your name when asking your questions if you want to be considered for the prize. You can ask as many as you like, so ask away, and the best question will be picked by your presenter. And that presenter is Mr. Bill Horn. He is the president of NDT Corporation, a non-destructive testing company based in Sterling, Massachusetts, where they evaluate all types of structures, including uh, our structures and materials, including concrete, timber, steel, masonry, asphalt, soil, and rock. He's worked in the transportation industry as a registered professional engineer for over 25 years and has experience successfully managing complex projects for many private and governmental clients and is published in the field of non-destructive testing and geoph geophysical investigations. Uh, and with that said, Bill, I'm gonna let you take it away. Thank you for joining me uh, here today, this afternoon to discuss geophysical test methods. There are a number of tools in uh, our engineering toolbox to do subsurface investigations and geophysical test methods. Uh, there's a variety of those tools. They're very, very beneficial. There's a lot of advantages, get a lot of valuable insight uh, into the subsurface conditions uh, in totality, more than just one data point. A boring just gives you one data point. A geophysical test method may give you a profile of 100, 200, 500 lineal feet of some information. So we're going to talk about that and we're going to talk about how energy waves propagate through various material, physical material like a concrete beam or a steel pile or transmit seismically through a layer of soil or a layer of rock and how those methods will be recorded and what information can we decipher from those velocities of propagation of energy waves. We'll also look at some electrical, electromagnetic methods, ground penetrating radar falls into that category. We'll talk about which one's gonna work the best. We got a bunch of case studies to go over and there will be some questions at the end. Time for questions at the end. So physical or seismic, are we sending this energy wave on a element, a structural element, or are we sending it into the ground? Uh, we've got to have sensors that are going to pick up the transmission results of these energy waves, the velocity, how quickly they traveled from A to B, and we need to know that distance. <clears throat> so our sensors are set at certain intervals. Energy waves travel along the surface, energies energy waves also travel inside a material, inside a concrete column, uh, inside a layer of soil or rock. Uh, but it's the material velocity or the distance traveled of uh, these compressional and shear wave velocities that we're most interested in. So if we think about dropping a, a pebble into a pond of water, we look at the rings that ripple out. That's a surface wave. When, when we do that to a concrete 
beam, we have a surface wave that travels along the surface of that concrete. And if our sensors are touching and listening for those waves to pass by, we can measure the velocity or the travel time from the zero point when the energy source, when the uh, stone hit the water or when the bearing hit the concrete surface. There's also waves that are reflected and refracted within the material that we're testing. Maybe it's in a soil layer, maybe it's in a steel pile. So it's a combination of surface traveling waves and refracted waves that travel within the material, within the soil. On the left, we have just a simple diagram of the energy source. Our receivers, sensors on the surface, maybe they're spaced every five feet and then the spacing goes to 10 feet. Uh, so there might be 200 lineal feet of geophones all connected. Surface waves travel along the surface and are picked up and then there's refracted waves that are traveled and picked up and we know the distances from them. But if it's a physical method, we're actually impacting a member a, that has a boundary condition, a steel pile, a concrete slab and measuring the amount of time it takes for that energy wave to go work within the structural member or element and travel from the energy source down to an interface to the boundary condition or to an anomaly or crack and then get reflected back up to where our sensors are. So here within the physical or seismic method, there's a couple of different ones. So we're going to talk a little bit about seismic refraction. That's a geophysical test method that has an energy source and there is a uh, compressional wave that travels along the surface and then there's a shear wave that travels within the layers of whatever we're testing and they travel in a certain direction. Uh, the we're basically using the energy transmitting properties of a soil layer or of a rock layer. Those properties are there. We have to induce an energy source and then the compressional waves are going to move along that boundary and we're going to measure how long it takes to get from the energy source to sensor one or two or three or four or whatever it is. So we have to create an energy source. We have to measure the travel time and then we can use a different energy source. If it's a 400 foot long array, we would probably start with an energy source at the zero station one at the other end 400 feet away and probably one in the middle 200 feet so we would and then move the sensors after we've got that information so there's a that three to one ratio i wanted to mention that that is basically the ratio of surface lineal footage that's needed to get the depth of penetration so if we want information 100 feet in elevation we need to have three times that distance on the surface or 300 feet on the surface to get information 100 feet down. Uh, this information is collected by geophones or hydrophones and they pick up small sensations of energy waves. Each energy wave has its own little fingerprint uh, and the information that we get from a seismic refraction survey is very, very valuable. We can get soil and bedrock profiles, thicknesses, kind of a general material identification. We're not going to get detailed subsurface conditions like you would from a split spoon sampling if you were doing a traditional soil boring. Uh, that information is needed for foundation design and bearing capacities. We don't necessarily get that from the seismic refraction, but we get some general material identifications, layering thicknesses. Is the soil loose? Is it overburdened? Or is it a dense till or a, a weathered rock or a, a marine clay deposit? Are there anomalies down there in the soil or the bedrock? Fractures, things like that. So those are on a large scale. The refraction information is very, very valuable. Some of the applications are bridge alignments early on before the final alignment of a bridge crossing is finalized. Where is the deeper rock elevations? Where are the shallower ones? Are they competent, strong enough to support the loads of the piers and the spans. Maybe the span lengths are still yet being determined. Bridge scour, a lot of applications there, not only trying to determine the embedment of the bridge supports, piers or abutments, particularly if it's on piles, we need to know the embedment into the riverbed, but how shallow is the rock depth? And if the abutment of the piers are founded on rock, that changes, uh, very easy to change the scour vulnerability 
as it relates to the bridge inspection process. Roadway alignments, pipe construction, sometimes you just want to know that you're not going to hit rock, that it's deeper than eight feet and you can put the pipe down or the utility down without impacting any rock. Uh, initial building design, slope stability, all very, very valuable information on these. So what do we need to do a seismic refraction? Well, we need an energy source. An energy source can come from a hammer hitting a bedrock outcropping or possibly a composite plate that is sitting on the ground for some of the shallow reflections or a size gun, which is basically a black powder shotgun shell uh, with no bullets, just a black powder uh, that has a little blasting mat that uh, keeps all the debris and the residual uh, rocks and water um, safe from the person collecting the data. Uh, also, you can drop a weight from a known height. That's a good way to induce an energy wave. Air gun, explosives, all are very, very effective in creating an energy wave that's going to travel through the soil and through the rock. And now we have to record this energy wave propagation. We need a seismograph, a 12 channel or 24 channel. That's how many sensors, how many listening points we have within the refraction survey. Cables connecting everything. Uh, they're spaced about maybe five or 10 feet apart. Geophones in that middle image, that blue um, peg stuck in the ground. A geophone is just a magnet suspended by a spring and it picks up any little vibration and records that electrically back to uh, the seismograph. Um, hydrophones are similar, they're just waterproof and they usually are connected and lay in a channel uh, parallel to the stream bed or across uh, the stream bed. The data that we collect uh, is uh, basically plotting out arrival times of these energy waves, channel one, channel two, channel three, etc. It's a lot of geometry that's involved and it's important to have these refraction lines straight, uh, a short tangential straight cord, if you will, not curving around a horizontal curve on a roadway. That geometry is very, very difficult. If there is changes in vertical elevation and those can be quantified by plus or minus a foot or two or five or 10 feet, we can account for that on the vertical scale, but the seismic refraction line of hydrophones or geophones, geophones generally has to be in a straight line. And the results, we get general soil profiling. We've got some weak soil and fill material on top, green, slower, shear wave, um, some tills or gravel or clays uh, in the mid ranges. And then where's the bedrock elevation? And is it a uh, competent bedrock or is it a weathered rock? Uh, or is it, uh, you know, uh, over consolidated glacial till where there's some still high velocities, but it's not the same as rock. It's also good for determining where the water table is. The advantages you get, you know, material identification over a large area, uh, and that's important. Um, a data point is just one data point, excuse me, a boring is one, just one data point. Uh, fairly accurate depth determination, plus or minus a foot or two. Uh, good correlation. If there is some boring or some uh, coring information, some subsurface holes, we can carry correlate that information very well. It's portable equipment, so uh, it's nimble, it's quick. We can mobilize it quick if we needed to. We can probably carry it on a plane for the most part. We've got most of it in Pelican cases that do travel well. Uh, generally, you don't need any permitting, a little bit cheaper and you get some great results when you can combine a refraction survey with a subsurface investigation program. In other words, do the refraction ahead of time, and then the soil borings can be possibly reduced in quantity and strategically located at critical areas. So hopefully we understand the seismic refraction, that's the seismic method. Uh, the downhole testing, it's a combination of physical and seismic methods. So we're gonna talk about a couple of them. Uh, right here. So uh, here we're using the energy transmitting properties of the soil uh, by inducing an energy wave and measuring how fast the compressional and shear waves travel through. 
and we're doing it from within a cased soil boring. So here we're not doing anything with B50, but between B49 and B51 at five foot increments, five feet down is in depth, shaded in yellow, five, 10, 15, 20. We have an energy source and then we have listening sensors in the other boring at various depths. So we're getting a profile, a velocity profile of the soil layer between boring 49 and boring 51. And then we can adjust uh, those energy sources and utilize other borings. Maybe there's a triangle configuration of borings. Maybe there's a rectangle or square configuration of borings. So that is transmitting from a boring to a boring. If we do have an infrastructure asset, such as a pile cap and a pile without access to the pile, uh, because if we had access to the pile, we can just test the pile. But if we don't have access to the pile and or it would be difficult to gain access, we can install a soil boring relatively close to where that pile and pile cap is, probably within uh, two meters, uh, four, five, six feet, something like that. And here we can induce an energy wave on the pile cap that will travel through the pile and be picked up by sensors within the case borehole adjacent to it. And there'll be a change in that velocity and energy wave once we get to the tip of the pile. We can plot that out based on the depth and the velocities and determine what the depth of the pile is by impacting the structure, the asset, and listening in a soil boring. So some of the applications, we can understand the difference between the two. The shear wave velocity is used in seismic design. Uh, general uh, rock and soil layers uh, of velocity, even Caterpillar to this day use, uses shear wave velocity in some of their rock rippability charts. So it's uh, an accepted way to measure rock strength. Uh, building foundation design, bridge design, uh, even finding where the soil layers are for pile length design. Uh, is that an end bearing pile design or is it a friction pile design and what's the develop development length that you need for that particular project? So the downhole seismic, we need an energy source and we need a listening device. The borehole hammer is our energy source and that boring has been advanced and a PVC well casing, PVC pipe has been installed there and it's been filled with water. The energy waves travel better when everything is uh, in water and then the triaxial geophone, which is the middle image, we're listening in an X, Y and Z direction. Uh, and then the borehole inclinometer measures how plumb the borehole is. If some borings are 70, 100, 150 feet deep, they can deviate from being drilled perfect, perfectly plumb. That adds a longer distance as we're measuring accurately between borehole to borehole, and we can accommodate and account for that change in, inc in inclinometer readings or where the boring is not perfectly plumb. So those are the uh, energy source and sensors that we generally use and also making sure that the soil boring is relatively plumb or accounting for it if it's not. Uh, downhole seismic, uh, we're measuring, again, this is some of the output that we want to record and make it easy for folk, people to understand. We're measuring the velocities and then we're interpreting the velocities on stronger and weaker layers of soil and rock and how thick those stronger or weaker layers are. And uh, we can do uh, tomographic data. If there's enough data to be collected, it is very uh, ideal for uh, color shading. Some of the blues would be the weaker, tra uh, slower traveling velocities, weaker materials. Some of the reds would be the stronger materials with higher velocities. You can kind of see the profile. Uh, very easy to see what's strong, what's weak, what's fast, what's slow. So vertical seismic profiling here. Now we've got a listening device in the hole and we've got our energy source on the ground spread out systematically from some zero point and uh, probably where the boring is and then we're systematically moving to the left or to the right, north, south, east or west from the boring, from that zero station and impacting the ground and recording the data at various depths within the borehole as it 
uh, as, as a casing and down at whatever depth we need. So we're either using two boreholes, using one borehole and impacting the structure or impacting the ground surface. So there's a lot of variations, but they all require a soil boring and installing a soil boring does take some time, some schedule lead time, and it is fairly costly uh, to put those in, but sometimes that's the only way to get the information that you need. So now that we've uh, done, everybody knows the difference between the physical and the seismic method, we're gonna work on the pile length testing and that is on the physical side of things where we're looking for our energy wave propagation within a bounded body within the limits of a steel pile or concrete pile or timber pile and we are measuring the wave velocity and measuring the time it takes for the compressional wave to be reflected off the tip of the pile we create the energy source either by a air gun or even just impacting the pile with a hammer. We do need access to the top or to the side of the pile and sometimes the access is right there and it's very easy to get to. Other times uh, we may have to perform some excavation to get down perhaps underneath or below a pile cap to really have access to the pile. But as I mentioned uh, for pile length testing, we measure the velocity in the pile. We have our sensors, the exact pile. We don't have to estimate that velocity. We measure the two-way travel time of our energy wave, and then we calculate the length. And if there's an anomaly, this is uh, more applicable in large diameter concrete piles. Uh, we may have a secondary reflection, or if we have access to the whole top of a six or seven foot diameter drilled shaft or caisson, maybe we can differentiate where some anomalies are on the northern quadrant of this drilled shaft versus the southern quadrant and try to understand where those anomalies. Those anomalies often are created uh, when there's adverse groundwater conditions and maybe the casing or what they call the can, which is the exterior form of the concrete pile is pulled a little bit too quickly. So if the can's pulled too quick and there's some excessive groundwater conditions, uh, you can get those inclusions that uh, can creep in and affect the cross-sectional area of the concrete pile. But the echo reflection of these energy waves it has great applications and we can do this with concrete piles, timber piles and steel piles. So uh, it works for all of them, even the auger cast piles. That's kind of a soil mixing uh, process. Timber piles for the length. Yes, we can use the way the tree grows. We can use that piece of wood as a wave guide uh, and have the energy wave travel uh, through the length of the the tree or the timber um, and all sorts of steel sheet piles, sheet pile, H piles, micro piles, uh, what have you. A couple pictures here of our concrete piles on the left is a uh, a case, a drilled, drilled shaft, maybe four or five feet in diameter on the right is a, a concrete filled pipe pile and we're testing that. The air gun, the sensors on the left, I think there's a hammer on the right. Uh, so examples of concrete piles, steel piles, we've got steel sheet pile. Uh, again, the equipment's very portable. It's on a little cart, uh, battery operated, so it gets around very easily from a vehicle to the actual test site. Uh, or our sensors around a steel pipe pile on the right, impacting that with a ball pin hammer and recording those reflected and measuring the travel times of those energy waves go down and back. As I said, timber piles also good application. We use some different sensors. Sometimes we actually put ratchet straps with sensors around the pile at uh, north, south, east and west, 90 degrees from each other. Sometimes even use two sets of sensors and two straps. Very important to measure the mud line at each one of the tests uh, where there is big changes around the perimeter of the pile. Uh, we can sometimes get secondary reflections. So when it goes from muck into a stiff marine clay, we may have a secondary reflection because of uh, the cohesion around the pile at that interface change. And if we have a soil boring that knows at that depth, 30 feet, 40 feet, whatever it may be, yes, there is a big material change. Uh, we can discount that secondary reflection and attribute it to the surrounding subsurface conditions and not an anomaly within the pile itself.
our pile testing equipment is also waterproof and it can easily go in the hands of divers. I said before we need access to the pile face. Sometimes if there's jackets around the piles, uh, there may not be access at the splash zone or even above the water line, depending on the, the freeboard or the clearance. Um, but we can easily put it in the hands of divers and impact the pile um, underwater and then have our sensors touching the pile and collect the data that way. So now we're going to uh, jump into another set of tools in our toolbox, and that's some of the electrical and electromagnetic test methods. Uh, magnetic gradiometers, electrical resistivity, and ground penetrating radar are the three that I chose to go over here today. So uh, the magnetic gradiometer uh, needs a soil boring to have the probe go down, the magnet go down, and it has to be relatively close primarily and only for steel piles. Magnetics, gradiometer doesn't work for timber pile lengths or concrete, uh, but steel piles, when you need to accurately know just how deep the sheet pile or H piles are, maybe there's a directional drilling of some utility lines going in, um, then that elevation accuracy is probably within about uh, four, five, six inches, whereas the accuracy of the other pile length testing probably within about 5% of the length, uh, plus or minus a, a foot or two. So we get that information when the magnet crosses past the tip of the steel pile, the polarity changes and shows up very, very easily. And we're basically looking at a contrast of the resistivity in the deposits or the conductivity in the deposits, depending on how you want to look at it. And when we have information, we can get a two dimensional slice of what the subsurface conditions are very similar to what the doctors and medical community do with CAT scan imaging today. So electrical resistivity again measures the soil conductivity uh, and the blue in these images is the conductive soil and the brown is the non conductive soil. So we can get the relative depths of these conditions. And in example C and D, there may be a conductive or non-conductive uh, anomaly within a soil layer, and we can identify the relative depth of that change in anomaly. The applications really good for water table documentation, uh, corrosivity of different infrastructure, pipes may be in a very corrosive environment, for instance. Um, Landfill investigations, has any of the contaminants breached the landfill? How is the liner performing and holding up containing some of these potential hazardous site, uh, hazardous information? Um, is there plume migration, the general conductive nature of the soil for material layers? Uh, grounding grid design, we wanna get the grounding wire into the conductive soil. So knowing how deep that conductive soil is, is very, very important. Um, and it's a great correlation when there's other soil boring information. That's a theme. I've said it a couple times here already today. That is definitely a theme. The equipment we need, we need some metal conductive stakes or electrodes, cables connecting everything, a power supply, a resistivity meter. But the most important thing is proper stationing of the surface area. So we know where we are, 10 foot grid, 25 foot grid, 100 foot grid, whatever it may be. Uh, the grid spacing usually is a direct correlation of the depth and the level of detail that you're looking for. So now we're going to switch and get into the electromagnetic test methods, uh, trend, and that's uh, magnetometer and gradiometers, and they measure the variations in the magnetic gradient of various things. Um, and different subsurface structures like tanks and piles and uh, utilities can all have variations uh, from this buried material. So understanding how those changes show up, what they look like, where they are, better yet, how deep they are, are all very important uh, in locating some of the tanks and the pipes and the structures. Um, electromagnetic, now we're going to talk a little bit about ground penetrating radar. Very, very helpful, useful tool in our tool belt. Uh, it sends and receives electromagnetic energy from the same shielded uh, transducer, which transmits and receives it. Uh, the real takeaway, though, is there's different frequency for GPR. The high frequency, not as applicable for subsurface conditions. 
although the high frequency is great for locating rebar within concrete. That's not what we're talking about here today. Low frequency, 400 megahertz, maybe 200 megahertz. That's the frequency band that's going to penetrate through the soil and detect the anomalies, the utilities, the rock, the piles, the uh, changes uh, in reflective conductivity relative to the overall soil around it. Now, there's always a little trade off between how clear something is and how deep you can penetrate. Uh, sometimes using having two or three different antennas and stacking that information together helps give you and engineers a better picture of the overall vertical profile of what we're investigating. But the electromagnetic energy is going to bounce off what's conductive. Uh, water's conductive, utilities, pipes are conductive. Salt is conductive and brackish water is very conductive. It's good to locate the brackish water, but it's not as good to penetrate through it and keep getting information on the subsurface conditions. Even the soil matrices can have some residual salt if there's a, a flooding uh, process that, that happens. Uh, even though it's out of the water and apparently dry, there may be a salt residue. That could really impact the effectiveness of ground penetrating radar. So the size of the antenna is direct correlation to the frequency. The lower the frequency, the larger the orange box. On the left, 200 megahertz uh, is a fairly large box. That's, I bet, two feet by two feet by one feet. The 400 megahertz is a very, very good versatile antenna. That's a little smaller. We have a wheel connected to it. So we have to keep track of our stationing. The middle image, we're looking for leaks in an earthen dam. I said before, water is conductive. <clears throat> if we go across a saturated soil layer and it changes from dry to wet, that's where the water is seeping through the earthen dam in this application. Good for sinkholes as well. There may be utilities, water lines, uh, drainage lines and parking lots. If they're compromised, uh, soil transmit or, or soil transport can take place in and around those pipes. And if it continues unnoticed for a long period of time, there can be some very large sinkholes that uh, can uh, uh, impact cars parking in parking lots, for instance. So the data that we get, uh, example of a grade beam running the full depth over on the left, uh, utilities uh, are, show up very clearly. Uh, as a, a peak, a little parabola as you cross over that utility and a concrete slab below grade on the right side. Uh, very uh, cha big change in contrast of colors uh, and can note that. Uh, a very good set of data here that I've got also in a case study is voiding under a concrete spillway slab. Uh, very good data that showed the thickness of the slab and then the an anomaly beneath the slab in an isolated area for about five or 10 feet. We did have one application where we can orient the radar antenna horizontally. And the question was with this abutment, uh, no dimensions or certainly no plans available, very common. Uh, what are the dimensions of the above? It's hard to do some engineering calculations or analysis if we don't have any dimensions. So, and what's it founded on? So by using the low frequency GPR or is orienting it horizontally, we can confirm there was a masonry facade and that's in yellow on the outside. The abutment was battered. There's a slope of that line that can be confirmed. And then we oriented the low frequency GPR vertically and confirmed that bedrock was less than five feet away. So didn't have any information on this abutment before our investigation. We've quantified the dimensions and confirmed that it's founded on bedrock after a short GPR investigation. As far as uh, burial plots and graves, um, I think CSI and Hollywood do take some liberties on the clarity that they sometimes portray. A GPR can provide, a, you, you can't really see, see details <laughs> of, uh, of burial plots, but you can see a change in a relative location of uh, that burial plot or an anomaly that's different than the surrounding soils. We're really looking for changes. We're looking for differences. So I've covered a lot of different um, tools in our tool belt, refraction and with the assistance of soil borings, electrical resistivity, GPR, uh, you know, judgment and experience is the best way to help 
choose the correct tool, but there's also some other criteria that everybody should be aware of. Um, what's the depth of investigation that we're looking for? Are we looking for you know zero to 30 feet or are we down 150 to 200 feet? That may dictate the method that's selected. Are we transmitting energy waves on the physical boundary condition or through the soil uh, or through with electrical methods? Uh, what are the objectives? What do you need to know to do the engineering analysis to preserve or assess uh, this infrastructure? Uh, what's the access like? Do we, is it better to have portable equipment that you can carry in? And if there is a subsurface investigation program planned, doing some of these investigation geophysical test methods prior to that soil boring program, that's going to provide the best results uh, in general. Perfect application, choosing the correct tool. What information do you need? If the information is deeper, then perhaps we need to have a series of soil borings installed and do cross hole testing. That takes a lot of lead time and a lot of cost to install the borings, a lot more data collection, but it is possible to get information of the velocity of these energy waves down 20 feet, 50 feet, 100 feet, whatever it is. Or is it as simple as just taking a 200 megahertz antenna, which is the right image, and pulling it along the roadway to locate pipe, utilities, anomalies, determine uh, the general soil layer and rock layering profile. So two contrasting tools, and it depends on what information you're really looking for. Um, electrical resistivity. This works great if it's in a very remote area with uh, maybe taking a cornfield and changing it into a strip mall. However, if you're in an urban area and there's light posts and guardrails and fence posts, chain link fence, an electrical resistivity survey is probably not going to be that effective. So it depends on the environment that you're in. Got a number of case studies I'd like to go through. We'll wrap things up and uh, save some time for some questions at the end. Hydro case study, I said uh, had that image where there was a void under the slab. We were asked to assess the concrete spillway and determine what's underneath the concrete spillway. The GPR confirmed the thickness and confirmed that there were some voids under the spillway. But as far as assessing the spillway, we used our impact echo pulse velocity equipment uh, where the energy source is on the right, it's an air gun and a four sensor array is on the left touching the concrete. We can get the compressive strength of concrete from this, from the velocities, and they're very relatively accurate compared to concrete cores, and we did that on that application. Another hydro case study, uh, there was a riser, kind of a chimney that controls a the elevation of a reservoir. No information at all on that. Some GPR helped us understand the reinforcing of this concrete riser. Uh, and then taking some, with the assistance of diver, we took some measurements underwater and got the concrete strength of that used in the evaluation. There's a couple of outfall pipes that we looked at. Some of those were debonded. Uh, I've got a bridge case study here where there was a structural flag that was on a bridge. And the reason for the flag was there was perforations in the web and flanges of all six of those H piles and no plans, didn't know anything on the details of the pile or the foundation. So we were asked to come in and in a, a half a day in the morning, we got the pile lengths and they were about 22 feet below the water elevation. And then we did a seismic refraction survey right down the middle of the stream and confirmed the rock was about 22 feet below the water depth. So it was very conclusive that these were steel H end bearing piles on rock, very safe to excavate three or four feet in the riverbed put some splices on the perforations in the steel and remove the flag. The local bridge owner loved that concept. It was relatively uh, quick and uh, cost effective for him to do that. Remove the flag. There was no detours, no bridge posting needed. So good application of that. Another bridge foundation case study where we were able to preserve pier foundations by confirming that they were all on rock and that they were salvageable. There was some investigation of the concrete, but the focus was are they all founded on rock? So our transverse line and longitudinal refraction lines confirm that the bedrock was very shallow. Foundation case study uh, using some cross hole testing uh, between 40 boring 49 and 50 and 50 and 51. The color plot 
is interpreting that and it shows the different layers of soil uh, for how the energy waves all again based on velocity. Um, a bulkhead or a marine retaining wall. Uh, there was a number of these sections about 3000 feet and some of the wall sections were built on rock. Some were founded on soil and some were founded on timber cribbing filled with rock, which is on the right hand image. Uh, we could determine which one was which. We also did refraction surveys around the wall because the repair was going to be anchoring precast panels in the riverbed and then tying them back at a with an anchorage, a rock anchor. Uh, so knowing the changes in rock elevations was very, very important. Seismic refraction investigation here for a new bridge alignment. In two days, we got rock profiles for a 1500 lineal foot uh, cross section and determined that the rock was less than 20 feet deep and it was competent rock. It could handle the loads of the piers. Uh, so spread footing was the design of choice and confirmed the span lengths uh, early on in the design. So really a, a great application uh, for this because you'd never get a soil boring rig in there to float on a barge. Um, and even then you wouldn't have continuous information over 1500 lineal feet and we got all that in two days. Towers, uh, not only do the legs have foundations and need to be investigated, uh, the cable supports that hold these towers up also have their own foundations and need to be investigated. So uh, testing the depth of these foundations and what are they anchored to are very, very important. Um, that requires GPR to locate the rebar, differentiate that from the rock anchor that is embedded into the concrete, testing the length of that rock anchor and knowing what it is. Uh, confirming where the bedrock elevations are over a long period. This is about 200 lineal feet and the top of rock was very clearly delineated by that white line. Now the GPR data here was uh, very, very good and that was primarily because of the contrasting conductivity of the soil, black and red data, from the rock, blue and kind of yellow data, which was lower. So the was very contrasting. GPR data doesn't always be, isn't always that clear, but this is an example of where it worked great. A retaining wall failure uh, had some uh, tiebacks that were holding the wall back and they were anchored to a concrete anchor point. We located those, directed some excavation, had access to them, confirmed were they reinforced, confirmed the dimension and got the concrete strength uh, all at the same time. Utility location, we'll try to break things down uh, on various squares uh, and track what we see as far as utilities or anomalies. We'll provide a very detailed legend or key within our map uh, to show what we found, the depth that we found it, and what it appears to be. Looking at walls, uh, voids beneath the sidewalk or behind the wall. Uh, so a lot of material transport going on. GPR, again, in the low frequency realm uh, is great for locating those voids and they can be contrasting to the existing soils and quantify where the voids really are. GPR is great for that. And there's different signal processing for the GPR and there's different computer programs uh, that can expedite that data analysis. Uh, a deep water aquifer case study uh, will owner was looking to install a well for pumping water out and they wanted to find the riverbed of the old glacial stream, not the current stream. So we had to locate that based on the geology, uh, which is a correlation of the bedrock. Found, a, um, a, found the, the pre-glacial stream, found the gravel in that, and there was a lot more water available. Tunnel alignment, we had a project down in Miami for uh, the Port of Miami and the weight of these tunnel boring machines are so heavy, you have to make certain that the rock layer that you're sitting on, resting on to do the tunneling is competent enough to support the weight of this and refraction uh, survey was ideal for that. And one last one, we've got a collaborative partner, uh, ASI Marine, we've mounted our impact echo pulse velocity equipment on underwater ROVs and 
application was a new pipe that was just recently installed. The owner, part of the final QA QC process, wanted to verify the thickness and the compressive strength of that new pipe. So we'll wrap things up here. Just a, a summary kind of a review. You know, the advantages for geophysical investigations. Um, a lot cheaper. Uh, you don't need to dig a lot of holes. Portable, quick, nimble, battery operated. Um, and you can get information over a large area. It's ideal for mapping out where the groundwater anomalies are and with foundations where the groundwater, knowing where the groundwater is helps minimize or mitigate some of the problems you can have in the excavations. And you know, the judgment is important to help us make sure that we choose the most effective tool for the application. And what did we learn? We, we hopefully today is a takeaway. Are we transmitting through soil or are we transmitting energy through a physical bounded element, uh, a pile or a soil layer? Uh, can be misleading if you're doing soil boring and hit refusal or even do some cores for a foot or two, still might be a large boulder and not necessarily bedrock. But if you have perspective over 400 feet or 800 feet or 2000 feet, you'll see that that is just an isolated boulder and not representative of the rock conditions in that area. And how deep are we trying to go down? Um, the electrical uh, versus magnetic versus uh, electromagnetic. Uh, again, the electrical resistivity testing is great when there's no other interferences. You put a chain link fence near it and it's not going to work that well. But if you have a profile of the rock, you really know where you stand and what conditions are down there. Um, if you're putting in utilities along an excavation, I think I mentioned that example. Maybe you just care that all the rock is eight feet deep or if it comes up shallow in one area, good to delineate that on the plans so the contractor won't be able to claim any change conditions. Oh, I encountered rock and uh, all sorts of changes and claims result of that. So we could probably cover a mile to almost maybe two miles in a day uh, with a single line along a roadway. Um, and the real takeaway, please, is a lot of this testing if it's done before a subsurface investigation program, in other words, before the borings are put in, that's where you're going to get the max the, the most information, kind of the most bang uh, for the for the least buck. Uh, very complimentary there. Ben, I think we're OK on time. Uh, we could open it up to some questions there. I'll, I'll give it to you. For sure, great presentation. We we're actually getting some good questions in here. Just a reminder, everyone, we are giving away a gift card, though. So if you uh, do give us a question, please leave us your name and to be considered for the gift card. I uh, will start with uh, Claude here. They said, "Is there empirical data correlating wave velocity wave velocity to soil strength based in soil types?" Based there soil is. Types? Yeah, there there is some correlation. Um, that's a little bit more on the advanced geotechnical and geologic side of things. We will just quantify the velocities and then provide that velocity information. There's another engineering step, fairly advanced engineering step that interprets that velocity information. But as I mentioned, Caterpillar still today does use shear wave velocities in some of their sizing charts for different uh, rock rip abilities on the back of dozers or hammers to get through different types of rocks. Good question. Um, from Farrell, can geophysical test methods be used to detect subsurface voids like abandoned coal mines 30 meters below ground? Um, yes, they can. Uh, 30 meters is uh, way out of the realm of ground penetrating radar. Uh, depending on the mine uh, configuration, you would have to have a series of refraction lines tightly packed. Uh, you know, a mine shaft, if it's, I don't know, eight by eight feet or something like that. If your spacing is 25 feet or 50 feet or 100 feet on some of these grid lines, you might miss it. But if you were to um, pick one up and then try to track it, it, it would be a challenge and you'd need a lot of field data. But I think it could be done and, and maybe there's some other uh, a combination of some electrical resistivity as well as refraction survey. 
In GPR, identify a broken water main pipe buried under a concrete slab, such as uh, the depth depth or location of any voids. You know, it probably could. Uh, wouldn't tell you that where the main broke, but it would tell you where the saturated soils are, and that's provided there's not a lot of steel or concrete in the slab that you're penetrating through. Most slabs are probably maybe six inches thick and might have number fours or number fives every six inches, single row, maybe a double row of reinforcing uh, steel. That GPR could penetrate through that and would identify, oh, saturated soils here, here, here. We would wanna cross over that saturated area and follow that. Um, so if the saturation of the line is running longitudinal, we're gonna define that with transverse lines of data collection. But yes, it would pick up where the saturated versus dry soil is, and that's a direct correlation to a break. And this question is kind of uh, related from uh, Cameron. Uh, uh, what's the, sorry, Cameron, what's the uh, effect of weather uh, or example frost on these methods? Would, uh, would the, the frozen water affect the readings you get? It does. Uh, it does affect it. Generally, these methods are uh, more effective and more accurate when we are dealing with non-thawed conditions. Um, and a uh, little, little hard to differentiate, you know, the top four feet in the northeast, let's say frost is down three feet, we're out in February. Um, we may be interested in information much, much lower than the frost level, and we may be able to get energy ways to penetrate through that, but uh, it can impede it. Uh, the, the frost is obviously the moisture in the air voids in the soil, so uh, it's better to do it when it's thawed, but if we, we have had success uh, where we've done wintertime investigations and accounted for that frozen material. About how far do the seismic energy waves travel? Or how far you know, they, it, it probably depends on the bang. Uh, for our civil engineering infrastructure assessments, we're probably interested in uh, a surface wave penetrating down 100 feet, maybe 150, 200 feet. But with a large explosion, uh, the oil and gas and mining industry, uh, they pick up pockets of natural gas, pockets of oil, uh, you know, 1,000 feet down, mile down, two miles down. Uh, so they, they, they have much more of a macro assessment on a larger area, but uh, a solid is a solid is a solid. Once they start propagating, unless there's a break, a fracture, an interface, uh, they will travel for a, a great distance. Kind of a long answer there. Uh, did you say it's possible to get compressive strength of concrete from energy waves? I did, I did, and it's both the shear and compressional wave velocity. It's that impact echo pulse velocity testing, the air gun that I showed a picture of in the four sensor array. Uh, we can get compressive strength uh, that are within 500 PSI, consistently within 500 PSI of cores that are sometimes taken. Uh, maybe there's some correlation with the cores or maybe some skepticism that our uh, values are that accurate. We'll identify a high strength area, a low strength area. We'll pull a couple of cores and they will be within about 500 PSI. But I'd add to it, you know, to take that core out of its element and break it in a lab uh, versus what I'm testing and the data that I'm collecting, I'll call it maybe a little more representative for the in situ compressive strengths. Uh, where the stresses may be acting on the middle point of the beam, for instance, or the column or the slab. So, uh, you know, you take that core out of its element, uh, you lose it a little bit, and that's still just one data point. I have a large coverage area. Every time I pull the trigger on that air gun, I get information on compressive strengths, and that can be covered over a large area. Good question, though, to clarify that. Um, can the impact echo be used to determine remaining concrete strength after a fire? Uh, yes, it can. The strength is the strength. Uh, if we know what the strength was before the fire and it's been adversely affected by the fire, or heat has impacted the concrete, and that can happen. We've been asked uh, on a number of different occasions to do that on concrete bridges. Then the change, uh, we're, we're going to get the strength. If the strength has changed, then that will quantify and confirm a reduction in the strength in that. 
Uh, we'd have to have kind of a smooth area sometimes after a fire. Uh, the concrete surfaces are rough and pitted and spalled. Uh, we just have to adjust <coughs> our sensors. Um, does the downhole seismic or crosshole testing work with a hole uh, in a hole with a steel casing? Uh, not as well as with a PVC casing. If it's uh, underwater, uh, that's uh, uh, preferable. And yes, a metal casing does have an impact uh, in allowing those energy waves to go through it. We want to have the, the the least amount of barrier between that. So uh, preference is a PVC well casing, maybe three inch, two and a half inch, three inch diameter. And if you're on a large project and there's different phases involved, rather than just backfilling the borings, if you think you might need some additional information, um, put a monitoring well and just put a, put a PVC well casing, put a protective head on it, and then you have access to that as opposed to backfilling the borings and coming back with phase two or phase three or phase four. And if you only had the borings there, you could still get subsurface information. Uh, George asks, uh, can can these methods detect whether the existing railway bridges foundation uh, have any piles and what information would you be able to get about those piles? Would you get the, the size and depth perhaps? That's a tough one. Um, the best way to determine if there's piles there would be to excavate down on one corner and find them. And then when you had access to the piles, we could impact, test the pile, get the integrity of its concrete, thickness of its steel, and the length, no matter what it is. To get an energy wave to go through a bridge abutment into the pile cap, down to the pile tip, bounce back up through the pile, pile cap, and bridge abutment, that's an awful lot to ask the energy waves to do. Uh, we have had some success testing a pile cap, but in generally we were also directly over the piles within that pile cap and could differentiate that. Um, so really, you know, some excavation, probably going to need some shoring. If you could pick a corner, find two piles, we can test both piles, uh, maintain the excavation. So uh, there are limitations to that. If the other would be some crosshole testing, but you can't have the borings <clears throat> too far apart. Uh, in that they generally probably need to be within about 20 or 25 feet max uh, between the cross hole testing. Uh, if you had a concrete slab uh, that was 6 to 12 inches deep, uh, which test would you use to uh, assess its conditions, its condition? Well, I think the impact echo pulse velocity would verify it's either 6 or 12 inches thick. Uh, and to assess the condition of that, we would want the compressive strength of the concrete. Uh, we didn't talk about half cell potential, but if there was concern for corrosion, I'd want to know what the possibility of corrosion would be with a half cell. Uh, and GPR would tell us what the reinforcing is. Is it a single row of reinforcing or a double row? So the answer is really a combination of methods, uh, but for assessing the concrete, I would say the impact echo pulse velocity gets you the strength, gets you the thickness, also tell you if the rebar is debonded or delaminated from the concrete. But how close should the borings for cross hole testing be? Oh, good, good question. Just mentioned that probably about 25 feet is probably the max, whether it's a triangle configuration or a square rectangle configuration. If they get up over three meters, uh, or excuse me, 10 meters, 30 feet, that's a little bit far. You're going to lose some of the accuracy, um, which is why it needs to be in a confined area. All right, I think we are uh, out of time here for questions, but we will be passing these along to Bill after the, uh, after the presentation. So uh, if you didn't get yours answered here, he will get those. If you think of any more, there's his contact information. So uh, he'll, his information will also be provided in our post uh, event emails along with links to the presentation slides that Bill was using and the recording of his presentation. Again, like I said, the recording is going to be on our website, wesavestructures.info forward slash webinars. Uh, this is where you can find our future webinars uh, once they are announced. And uh, this is also where you can find the recordings of our, or sorry, the, uh, the PDFs of our slides. And with that said, thank you, Bill, for this awesome presentation. Great. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Great questions, and I uh, appreciate you spending some time with me today. 
Thank you, Bill. And thank you all for coming. And let's get out there and save some structures. Thank you.